in the stream of dissolved gases. And he used that to measure nitrous oxide concentrations from a motorboat in streams of various sizes. And one of the results from that showed that uh, nitrous oxide concentrations in general in increase exponentially as stream order decreases. In other words, as you get into smaller and smaller streams, concentration increases. And so we got interested in, in looking for ways that we could better understand what's going on in these smallest headwater streams. But we didn't have, we had a, a good instrument that we could use, but we didn't have a platform for it. And that's where Ryan's boat really came in handy. And when we discussed the project with him, he got very interested in it and did some sample runs that summer in some of the Huck 12 watersheds in the Cannon River watershed. And uh, uh, we took that data and showed it to FSA and they agreed to fund the project. And Ryan has taken it from there and with help from some others, I think we made some progress and we're gonna hear about Ryan's part in all that today. And so with, without further ado. See, well, uh, thank you for that inter introduction, uh, John. Hello everyone, both over Zoom and in person here. Thanks for coming to my uh, master's defense on my project, a raft-based method for Lagrangian sampling in headwater agricultural streams. So this project is really about um, kind of the, the challenges associated with the specific landscape, headwater agricultural streams, and the ways that both land managers and researchers have had to kind of adapt to these challenges. So we'll start from the perspective of, of a land manager and looking at this, this system. So headwater agricultural streams um, are fairly uh, new uh, kind of uh, top or hydrologic and topo topographic um, systems. So um, most of Minnesota was covered by glaciers during the last glaciation 10 to 12,000 years ago. And this left a landscape um, called the prairie pothole region across much of the area. And this is characterized by uh, shallow uh, wetlands that kind of pool water across this landscape. And it's marked by very uh, poorly de developed uh, drainage systems. So it's a young landscape um, with a lot of potential for uh, agriculture. Um, but uh, Early, you know, farmers pre-settlement or just after settlement had to adapt to these uh, these hydrologic issues of these these wetlands, and this came in the form of uh, of addressing this challenge with infrastructure. Here, uh, we use tile drains. So, a tile drain is kind of a method of um, lowering the uh, the water table in agricultural streams that would normally be flooded or be present as wetlands. And originally, these were in the form of uh, actual tiles, ceramic tiles that were placed that per, uh, allowed for kind of a preferable flow path for surface water to leave these systems. And nowadays in industrial agriculture, they're coming in the form of perforated uh, plastic tiles. And you can see some aluminum tiles here. All of this as a kind of method to address the flooding characteristics of this landscape. Um, tile drains are extremely prevalent in the Midwest, especially in Southern Minnesota, where up to 50% of the total county area is uh, drained using these tiles. So this is a, a practice that has you know, been developed over the years and um, it is really applied at a field scale to address some of these flooding issues, but very, very prevalent in the Midwest. Uh, alongside these challenges with the, um, the water and water residents on the landscape, uh, there's also an agricultural intensification taking place. And we're going to focus on the role that nitrogen has played in this intensification. Uh, this figure here shows the, the increasing prevalence of uh, nitri nitrogen-rich fertilizer consumptions in the United States since the 1950s, kind of uh, resulting from the uh, Haber-Bosch process, which made this available for land managers. And it has a correlation with uh, yields that we've seen in corn production in the United States with a marked uptick coming around the time of the introduction of this nitro nitrogen fertilizer applications. So nitrogen itself um, has many different species that can exist in, in the soil, uh, the soil uh, matrix. And one of those is uh, nitrate. So nitrate is um, especially mobile. Um, it can be leached through uh, precipitation events um, from the soil. It can be picked up in water and moved through runoff. And this creates a number of challenges, again, related to the landscape where water is, is an issue and water on the landscape and removing that water from the landscape is an issue. Um, here we can see that 
this uh, has implications for both kind of meteorological patterns and uh, management uh, considerations. So on the right, this diagram here shows um, the kind of uh, a zone for uh, maximal uptake of nitrogen in corn that occurs uh, at a certain time in the growing season. Uh, so this is when farmers would want to have nitrogen available for plant uptake on field. And this time period uh, correlates or kind of overlaps with a period of increased uh, probability of high precipitation events in um, uh, south southern Minnesota. So um, when uh, nitrogen needs to be on these fields for crop production, there's also a higher chance of um, some of these precipitation events that can cause nitrogen to, to leave these watersheds in the form of nitrate. So to adapt to this, um, a number of best management practices have been applied in the state. Um, a number of which are looking to uh, increase the amount of time that nitrogen rich water spends on these surfaces. And here you can see just a, a vegetated strip. Um, this would uh, seek to kind of slow down the overland flow paths of, of uh, water and allow for a, um, a kind of bio uptake through this perennial vegetation of some of those nitrate uh, nitrogen species like nitrate. Um, there are more uh, kind of intense methods of uh, or best management practices that have been explored. Um, this shows a bioreactor being constructed, and um, these these methods just continue to use the processes of the you know, my, microbial um, nitrogen fixation to try to remove some of that nitrate that would be mobilized in the soil system. Um, and the most prevalent in the state of Minnesota can be seen here. Um, alongside this stream is a riparian buffer. Um, in the state of Minnesota, there is a mandate for uh, the inclusion of riparian buffers on all surface water streams in the state, varying in size. But this is done with the, um, the, the, uh, the goal of finding a way to reduce uh, the impacts of erosion, which then can reduce um, uh, nutrient loading uh, through um, uh, nutrients that are more tied to a soil matrix, such as um, phosphorus. But in these agricultural streams, tiles actually uh, prove kind of a shortcut around these systems where um, water on the surface here is being drained uh, through this tile and entered into the surface stream without actually coming into contact with that perennial vegetation. So change is uh, kind of required in some of these, uh, these systems in regards to this nitrogen and water interaction. Um, conservation practices um, represent a, a large cost, both in implementing them with some of those intense ones like constructing a bioreactor, but also with removing land from production um, by uh, taking out you know, a buffer, buffer strips that would be productive land. Um, there's also agricultural costs associated with not um, using or applying nitrate efficiently, nitrate that's leaving the, 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 the field and the watershed. Um, that was meant for uptake in crop production. It results, or it, it's an example of an inefficiency in that system. And there's also local impacts of this high nitrate that can affect public health concerns and also recreation. And here we can see some headlines um, relating to high nitrate in drinking water. And this can actually prove um, uh, some, some fatal effects through things like blue baby syndrome in the Midwest. Uh, at scale, um, it's important to note that all of these watersheds are kind of connected to broader catchments like the Mississippi River Basin. And to quote this here, the principal source areas of nitrogen are basins in southern Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and they drain agricultural land that essentially ends up uh, in the Gulf of Mexico down the Mississippi River Basin. So the nutrients that are transported through this watershed chain um, can cause hypoxic zones, which pose an economic and an ecological um, threat or concern. Uh, chapter two. So we looked at some concerns with the, the landscape and how uh, landowners might uh, have or have and might want to change their practices and their infrastructure in order to deal with issues of you know um, flooding and nitrate usage. But now we're going to look at what a, a researcher would do to um, look at some of these, these challenges on the landscapes. So um, we're going to talk about scale because that's a very important concept when we're talking about field practices relating to large scale impacts at watersheds and even at the, the scale of the Mississippi River Basin. So in terms of small spatial scales, when I um, talk about that, I'll be referring um, to uh, in individual field practices. This is on the order of, of acres. Um, as small temporal events, this would be on the order of uh, you know, hours to, to days, and it can include things like, uh, like rain events or certain points, um, oh, excuse me, in uh, the growing season or when a practice is applied. Um, just different ways of breaking down um, different components 
of these systems. Uh, at large spatial and temporal scales, spatially, this would be looking at kind of the, the impacts of, of regional practices as a whole. This shows the, the Minnesota River Basin and um, kind of aggregating all of the impacts that are seen on individual fields there. This would be considered a large scale occurring at on the order of uh, square miles, hundreds of square miles. Um, temporally, uh, large events would be kind of seasonal annual events like um, melting, uh, crop rotations, things like that. So the goal of this, uh, this methodology is to link these changes that we see at scale um, by measuring the water that connects them. So the water that's in these small scale spatial features in these fields is eventually um, making its, their way out of those small catchments and into larger catchments like the Minnesota River Basin and the Mississippi River Basin. Um, the objective here is to identify and quantify these changes and to connect these dynamic processes to management practices like the BMPs that we've discussed uh, earlier. So um, from a, a, a perspective of someone looking to study watersheds, there are a few different ways that you can conceptualize this. Um, reference frames is kind of uh, uh, one way of looking at either aggregating spatially or temporally data from a watershed. So this cartoon of a watershed here shows um, a, a catchment that's bounded by um, uh, surface elevation. So all you know, rain in this area would be draining through this catchment and would exit at this single point. Um, a Eulerian reference frame would seek to uh, uh, measure a flux from this watershed as a whole. So by measuring fluxes through uh, a certain point through a control structure like this, uh, this um, flume, or not flume, excuse me, um, collapsed dam <laughs> shown here, um, you could get an idea of flow through an area, and then you could compute things like loading of, of certain nutrients through that watershed. Um, this is useful in terms of uh, some management styles, like uh, maximum daily loads can be calculated for watersheds based on this. But if you want to find out small spatial um, variability, say at a single field here, there are a number of ways, that, things that you'd have to do to expand this. And this could look like just in, including more of these Eulerian reference frames, including them at smaller and smaller scales in the watershed. And hopefully you can find uh, some of these individual fields um, from these Eulerian reference frames. But by the time you get to uh, putting monitoring stations at every little point in a watershed becomes prohibitive, both in terms of uh, um, labor, technology, and, and maintenance. So another reference frame to kind of deal with this limitation is a Lagrangian reference frame. And this takes a look at flow path dynamics through the watershed. So um, to use kind of an analogy, a Eulerian reference frame would be, um, uh, in, in terms of something like measuring uh, fish <laughs> for a moment, uh, uh, measuring the number of fish that pass through a structure like a dam in a certain amount of time would give you kind of a flux of the, those fish that'd be a Eulerian reference frame where a Lagrangian reference frame would actually be following the path of that fish. You could be monitoring things like the, the, the weight of the fish properties related to it, but you're following it along a certain flow path. Um, but for our project, we're not measuring fish, we're measuring a water parcel. And this is uh, kind of the basic unit that we're seeing traveling through a watershed. So this is uh, an area of water that is you know, homogenous in, in some sense, um, related to its in-stream concentrations at any given moment through the stream. And this parcel follows a vector as it drains down the stream. Um, and we're trying to follow this, uh, this parcel and measure how it changes in relation to additions and subtractions through um, uh, confluences with other streams, losses through things like groundwater, and then transformations of the nutrients within this water parcel through things like um, denitrification. So there's been a push for um, sampling from a moving platform, both in kind of a Lagrangian sense and then just in a kind of a spatially discrete sense for a while. Um, over the last 20 years, uh, there's been a lot of different methodologies that have been developed. Um, on the top here, we're showing a hydrosphere, and this has been used in the eastern United States to measure uh, estuaries. This is a passive sensor um, that is placed in the stream. Uh, it has sensors on it to measure things like pH, and uh, the, the flow of the stream just carries this through the watershed. Um, no methods of propulsion. It's just placed in the stream and picked up when it gets to another point. It can provide an example of how uh, these parameters change as they move through the stream. Uh, the flame system or fast limnologic, lim limnological automated measurement system, uh, which you can see attached to the back of a boat here, is a way that's uh, to measure spatially discrete data um, that's been uh, 
produced in uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, and this has been used in uh, limnology census studying lakes and studying large rivers. Again, finding ways to uh, link specific changes in properties like pH to locations in the stream. At a smaller scale, um, canoes have also been used to carry platforms. And um, more recently, drones have also been used as an unmanned way of uh, taking sensors down a stream, attempting to follow a flow path in a Lagrangian sense. Um, take a step back now, um, return to uh, the headwater agricultural streams. These streams uh, represent a confluence in um, the, the concerns that uh, chapter one brought about. So these streams are uh, potential areas for high nitrate um, concentrations as they occur next to the source of some of this application of this nitrate, whether it's um, fertilizers or for looking at the reduction of that, that nitrate uh, impacts through um, BMPs. Um, they're important on an on a impact-based management scale as um, field level practices can be adjusted and can be implemented. And we've seen that through um, BMPs being implemented at field scales. And also sensor uh, GPS and GIS technology um, are all at a point um, where they support um, the kind of fine scale spatial resolution um, that would allow for this data to be collected. So agricultural streams are a, a good example of exploring this Lagrangian methodology. Um, but they are extremely challenging to sample. And um, a number of the methods that I've shown um, for this uh, are would not be suitable for um, uh, headwater agricultural systems for a number of reasons. Um, the first here is that they are uh, productive landscapes and they continue to show characteristics of being used for, for agriculture, in this case, pasture land uh, for some, uh, some cows. They're, they maintain characteristics of, of this, including um, collapsed dams and culverts that might be hazards. This shows barbed wire fence that was across the stream. Um, and it, it's, it's common to find other uh, hazards um, that you might not expect other than animals in these landscapes. It's also important to note that um, in the state of Minnesota, accessing these streams can be uh, challenging from a legal perspective. Uh, you are able to sample the, 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 the Thalwag area of the stream um, but the banks of the stream are considered private property unless um, you're granted access from a landowner. So um, you need to be careful about where you access these streams and having a Lagrangian methodology is a way of addressing this. Uh, this these streams are, uh, I guess this is a typical example of what these headwater streams look like. So this is what we consider to be a ditch. It's a trapezoidal in shape. It uh, is roughly 10 to, or five to 10 feet wide. And it can be as shallow as six inches, which is a very, very variable um, kind of depth. Um, and a sensor platform would need to be able to uh, work in this low water and in these very, very narrow streams. And you can see kind of the extent to which this, this happens. Um, these streams also maintain fat features of their, um, their previous kind of historical morphology, including things like flow through wetlands. Um, so here you can see in the middle of a wetland, um, some of those other methodologies, whether it be a drift or drone-based sensor platform, would uh, not be able to reliably um, get through a section of wetland. There's also seasonal variability. Um, so flooding events, rain events, spring melt events can cause uh, 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 flotsam, <laughs> can cause logs, log jams like this to form, which if you're trying to study a, a flow path through these, you need to be able to get around this to get over it it will maintaining in the legal bounds of the stream. Flow regimes in agricultural uh, ditches um, also uh, vary quite a bit. This shows a, a flow in an agricultural headwater stream over the 2021 sampling season. Uh, and note the overall seasonal variability in flow from zero to 250 cubic feet per second, but also uh, specific events can also uh, have uh, spikes in flow that occur on the scale of uh, weeks rather than months throughout the season. And this variability uh, has other characteristics that accompany it, accompany it, accompany it uh, in the stream bed. So this can look like emergent growth, vegetative mats that need to be um, kind of traversed more than paddled uh, in the early months of the, the, the season. Uh, can look like uh, ice and snow on the stream. And then in 2021, for a period of a few weeks, the stream was completely dried up. So having a method that's able to um, sample these streams across these different morphologies is very important. 
So our solution here, as John mentioned, is a specialized platform and specialized sensors. So the specialized platform is called a pack raft. Uh, you can see it here. This is an inflatable craft. Um, this video works. Uh, it's lightweight. Um, it packs down to about the size of, I think, two paper towel tubes that are stacked on end. Um, it can be stored in a backpack, carried in a backpack, strapped on a bike. Um, but with uh, uh, it, it's a very robust uh, kind of uh, platform vehicle, <laughs> if you if you would call it that. Um, it's made of a, a very robust fabric that's puncture resistant, and it's kept at such a low pressure that even if it does puncture, it won't completely deflate. Um, it's uh, very, very uh, low draft, so it can be paddled in streams as shallow as six inches, and it can hold 800 pounds. So um, uh, an operator and um, all of the, the uh, sensor platforms that you could, you could include on this. Um, so instrumentation, again, as, as John uh, mentioned, uh, there's a necessity for high frequency, light, stable, and robust sensors. And we found that um, in the Hawk Nitrotex, which is an optical nitrate sensor. It has internal corrections for um, temperature and turbidity, and it uh, collects uh, data at a sampling rate of one, uh, one hertz, so one reading per second. And this and it proved to be uh, the, the best sensor that we found for, for this application, and all the data presented uh, in the rest of this presentation will represent nitrate data collected from this sensor. Um, with that being said, we included a number of other sensors in the platform, um, including a YSI EXO2 sonde. And this uh, was a multi-parameter sonde, which allowed us to collect uh, other parameters, um, seven uh, of which are shown here, uh, just for auxiliary data sources. Um, an SCAN spectralizer was recently added in 2022, and this is another way of per providing kind of redundant data um, and it's broad spectrum strip spe spectrometer that can collect uh, total night or total carbon estimates as well as redundant nitrate estimates. And uh, recently too, in 2021, we included a Bandolero discrete sampler and this collects uh, up to 112 milliliter exotainer vials. So for um, uh, properties or parameters that uh, are that don't have a reliable uh, field uh, ready method of optical or electrode uh, monitoring, such as phosphorus, um, actual samples can be taken and referenced um, on a Lagrangian, uh, 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 Lagrangian reference frame. So sensor validation with the NitroTax uh, was taken using grab samples from this boat. And these were uh, uh, run with the Latchet uh, flow injection analysis um, and there's good agreement between the, the nitrotax and what we were seeing uh, in more laboratory appropriate methods for nitrate. Um, this instrumentation, all of these in situ samplers were then geo-referenced with a GPS and logged in a data logger. So as samples were taken at a one hertz sampling frequency, uh, the, a, a specific uh, GPS location was associated with it, with it that could then be accessed and brought into a GIS environment for analysis. Um, this also shows a, the bandolero uh, here with the exotainer vials and a heads up display which became important for troubleshooting uh, while on the, the, the boat. Um, deployment was pretty simple. These, uh, if the water was deep enough, these sensors could just be put into the stream. Uh, most attached to the boat itself, but a aluminum rod also allowed for um, raising and lowering the the, uh, the area where these sensors were monitoring in the stream. And this was important, especially in those low water conditions. In a lot of cases, it wasn't necessarily the draft of the boat that kept us from monitoring small streams. It was how uh, far these sensors were hanging in the water. Uh, it should be mentioned too that uh, originally this was designed with that trip in mind. Um, so uh, at the start of this project during COVID, um, the, the, uh, the platform was kind of designed with a single operator in mind. So all of the, the equipment that I've mentioned with the exception of the Bandolero could be stored on a bike, could be carried by a single researcher. And these sampling runs would leave the bike at the end. Uh, I would drive to the start of the, the stream, inflate the boat, deploy the sensors, paddle down the stream, and at the end, pack everything up, put it on the bike and drive back. And again, this was a necessity to some degree because of um, limitations with um, COVID restrictions, uh, but it also allowed for flexibility in this project. So um, it was very easy to get out to a certain kind of temporal event. If there was a rain event that we wanted to sample quickly, um, this was a good way to do that. 
Um, and here's just a brief comparison with some of the, the earlier methods uh, uh, that I talked about. So um, this uh, design, this methodology was specifically designed to uh, work in these headwater systems, which have all of the, the issues of obstructions, access issues, and variable flows. Um, it's also specifically kind of designed for these wetlands, which um, would, would not be able to access by these other, these other, these other methods. Um, with that being said, there are kind of some applications in water bodies where the, the pack raft method would not be as appropriate, where uh, motorized boats or drone uh, craft would be better suited for that. So now we'll look at how um, applying this Lagrangian methodology to these agricultural streams. What are we able to find in terms of uh, channel network features and in-stream nitrate concentrations? So the sampling scheme uh, developed as we developed this methodology. So initially, we were um, taking a survey of these, these streams to see if we would see changes. We weren't sure that at this small scale, if um, the, the in-stream concentrations would be homogenous um, just due to you know, similar practices being used on these, these landscapes and maybe impact of kind of legacy fertilizer application. Um, over time, that developed into studying long-term temporal trends with sampling occurring on a weekly basis in these streams. And then eventually uh, we uh, included event-based sampling too, trying to identify these hot moments in a temporal sense and hot spots in a spatial sense to see if there are certain times and places in a watershed that are most impactful on in-stream nitrate concentrations. Uh, in terms of the sampling, uh, in 2019, there were about 10 survey paddles. Uh, and these were, again, just to find out uh, what watersheds could be paddled and to, to, to find very, uh, very kind of rudimentary data on in-stream concentrations. This developed in 2020 with sampling uh, accounting for that long-term uh, trends with sampling occurring at about a one once per week basis if flow allowed. And then 2021, there were 24 sampling events, these uh, both accounting for the long-term trends and these hot spots and hot moment sampling. In total, this represents about 400 miles of stream being assessed for the study and 300 miles of stream being sampled with that full sensor platform. Um, specific sites that we'll be uh, talking about here um, are Crane Creek and High Island Creek. Uh, Crane Creek is seen here in um, uh, the Cannon River watershed and High Island Creek uh, just to the west in the lower Minnesota River watershed. Um, both of these were selected due to the kind of mixture of uh, wetland features and conventional agricultural practices, as well as being within an hour and 15 minutes of the Twin Cities. Um, Crane Creek, which was the focus in 2019 and 2020, you can see here how it was, uh, or pre-settlement, uh, it was uh, made up of, of wet prairie, um, oak openings and, and wetland, um, wet, wet prairie areas. And it retains some of those features. Uh, in the Western part of the watershed here, there's a complex of wetlands and open water lakes that serves as the uh, headwaters for um, Crane Creek, which then drains west to east through this area of conventional agriculture. And when we first ran this section, we weren't sure what we would, would see. And we were surprised by how complex the in-stream concentrations appear to be. And I'll take a moment here to just uh, describe this data format because it'll come up again and again in this presentation. But you're looking at an aerial base map. Um, this doesn't necessarily represent what the landscape looked like at the time of sampling. It's just there to provide some kind of spatial context for the size of fields, um, the presence of, of, of uh, areas like lakes and, um, and uh, certain practices. Uh, the blue is surface water, both ditches and streams that's provided by the state of Minnesota. And then over top of that is our Lagrangian sampling in this case for nitrate. Um, so green represents uh, low nitrate concentrations with red being relatively higher nitrate concentrations. And you can see that in this watershed, um, certain features like confluences appear to have impacts on in-stream nitrate but it's not necessarily straightforward with other confluences having, uh, having less of an impact on, on in-stream concentration and other uh, variability taking place. So we were excited to see um, this in, in some of our early runs. In 2021, 2022, we switched to High Island Creek, um, another uh, watershed that uh, maintains a lot of the properties uh, of, of wetlands that it once had. Um, this time, wetlands are centered in the kind of middle of the watershed with conventional agriculture being prevalent in the headwaters western section and in the eastern section. Uh, and that can be reflected in uh, some of the trends that we see in in-stream concentration as well as the morphology. 
uh, in the western section here, uh, we see relatively high uh, in-stream nitrate concentrations. Uh, the middle of the watershed, which is made up of a large wetland complex, um, we can see changes uh, and a decrease in nitrate concentrations as you paddle through that location. And in the eastern part of the watershed, there's a, a more kind of natural stream morphology with um, flow through wetlands. And you can see kind of intermediate values for in-stream nitrate concentration. Um, so the results uh, are aimed at showing that this platform is capable of capturing some of the spatial and temporal variability that we would expect from these, uh, these watersheds after these kind of initial runs. Um, and it presents a number of case studies of the patterns and features found during these sampling runs. So we'll start first with um, spatial features. Um, this is a uh, High Island Creek watershed, and we're specifically going to be looking at the most headwater portion of this watershed, which we call Western High Island Creek. Um, this dark black line shows a sampling run, Lagrangian sampling run, that took place in this creek um, on August 30th, uh, 2021. Uh, here I've highlighted the specific impacts of confluences, or smaller subcatchments that are acting as additive um, sources of water and potentially nutrients into the mainstream channel. Um, uh, confluences are labeled and colored and they're correlated to the XY plot uh, below showing nitrate concentration on the Y and cumulative distance of the stream on the X. And it can be seen that uh, these confluences don't necessarily have uh, the same impact, some of which result like C in uh, dilutions in concentration as you paddle past it. Others like D show um, increases in concentration as you uh, paddle past these watersheds. So this suggests that um, there are areas and specific subcatchments that may be more impactful in terms of total in-stream nitrate concentration than others. And in a broader sense, this run represents um, an eight mile portion of this watershed uh, representing dozens of square miles. And this is a, a quick way to um, gather data on a number of these watersheds from a moving platform that would be um, uh, more labor intensive to do by other means. Um, going at one spatial scale smaller, um, we can actually pick up on some of the impacts of individual tile drains. Um, so paddling the section over and over again, we started to notice tile drains that were flowing and would mark them out on the GPS unit that we had uh, on the boat with us. Another kind of benefit of having an operator on the boat, you can collect auxiliary data like this that wouldn't be possible with something like a droned method. And in total, uh, we can show that <laughs> this is a very um, tile drain dense <laughs> uh, portion of the watershed. Again, um, this is representing maybe an eight, eight mile section of stream, but over a hundred tiles that were reliably flowing over the course of four sampling runs. Uh, so pinpointing a specific tile, um, uh, this one in particular, uh, we can see that there are some impacts that you can measure or that can be measured on the in-stream nitrate concentrations that can be associated with these tile flows. Um, so the XY plot here shows you know, a relatively stable lower in-stream nitrate value. And then this tile is, is passed and there's an increase in about 0.15 uh, milligrams per liter past this tile. Um, now, there's, uh, there's a gap in the data here because in this case, the sensor was actually removed from the stream and placed into the tile to get a reading for what that concentration was. Um, and it was removed just for the, the sake of uh, keeping the, the y-axis uh, and highlighting that, that variation because the tile was flowing at 16.3 uh, milligrams per liter. Moving on, uh, wetlands are also an important feature in these, uh, these watersheds, a spatial feature. And uh, like I said, the, uh, the middle section of High Island Creek contains a high density of herbaceous wetlands. Um, that was a focus for this study to, to try to uh, quantify some of the impacts uh, of them. You can see here in the inlay, there is a, uh, or these herbaceous wetlands occur um, mainly around these stream channels. Um, and this kind of represents the idea of a flow through wetland or a wetland that has a stream that both enters and exits it that uh, kind of mediates the, the, the size of the wetland and the flow that's retained in that wetland. Um, you can see that there's uh, runs that show uh, changes in in-stream nitrate concentration through these wetlands. And we'll take a closer look at that here. Um, this is showing a specific wetland with open water characteristics. And as you paddle through this wetland, there is a response uh, in terms of in-stream uh, nitrate concentration. Um, 
So there's not necessarily a trend of increasing or decreasing, but there's variability uh, over the course of this, this wetland. Um, this is a, an important uh, uh, aspect of this, this methodology too, with being able to even reach these, these wetlands. Um, a lot of these uh, have those um, kind of uh, log jam features. This one in particularly uh, had log jam features on either side of it and varying flow regimes would keep um, other methods from being able to access them. Also low water in the wetland and vegetation would keep other methods from being able to capture some of the variability that we see across this feature. Um, moving forward to temporal trends, I'll share uh, one uh, example of the spring melt event from uh, 2021. And this is what the stream looked like on uh, March 19th, 2021, when we first started uh, sampling. Um, and this figure uh, kind of represents uh, in-stream nitrate concentrations shown uh, here, uh, and then stream discharge uh, shown in this, this inlay. So there are five sampling runs that were done as the, the spring melt event progressed. Um, first occurring on March 19th, shown here, which occurred before a, a precipitation event. Um, the next four occurred um, after this precipitation event had occurred where there was um, a response seen in the in-stream channel flow. And the concentrations uh, responded to this, this event. So from March 19th at a, a concentration of around 4.5, Coming back a week later after this precipitation event, it had increased to about 18, um, or uh, you know, a factor of, of, of three um, in increase from what we had seen. Uh, and as the melt event progressed, uh, slowly dropping ranges in in-stream nitrate concentration, um, but also the appearance of specific features that had kind of been washed out. So on March 26th, uh, a uh, number of uh, th these features or, um, in the water, or the, the range of, of nitrate values in this, this stream section appear to be within a, a kind of a tight range. And as the string, stream, uh, or sorry, as the, the season kind of progressed, some of these features like wetlands shown here, highlighted, and a lake flow become more prevalent in their impact on in-stream nitrate concentrations with uh, this lake outflow point, for instance, um, having kind of a, a dilution step effect, and then wetlands having variable effects from increasing in-stream nitrate to decreasing in-stream nitrate. Um, so an example of how to capture some temporal var variability and compare runs over multiple dates um, based on a Lagrangian reference frame. So we can see that this method is capable of both identifying and quantifying hot spots and hot moments uh, on the, in these agricultural watersheds. And it allows access to potentially unreachable features such as the, the wetlands that we showed. Uh, it also allows for large portions of the watersheds to be characterized. Uh, going back to the figure on uh, uh, confluences, um, that represents a large part of the, the watershed that would be difficult or labor intensive to monitor by other means, where a single run in a day can characterize impacts from a number of these different subcatchments. So looking at the broader implications and next steps of this data, uh, now, I've been very careful about some of the terminology I've used in regards to in-stream concentration. Um, so, of course, the data uh, shows the impacts of some drivers and mechanisms that are affecting this in-stream concentration, um, but it's limited in how it can explain these drivers and mechanisms. And that's just a feature of the Lagrangian reference frame. So, um, it, it, it would be useful to be able to couple loading data with this. So, as you paddle past a, a confluence, if you could have an estimate for the amount of nitrogen that's moving past rather than just the concentration uh, would be useful for things like budgeting. And you can start to um, actually uh, find the impacts of these individual features or temporal events. Um, but this concentration is useful for hot spots and hot moment identification. So we did make quite a bit of effort into addressing this kind of flow concentration uh, issue. And this came in attempting to put together a mixed reference frame. Um, so we'll go back to the cartoon of the Eulerian reference frame. Again, this is looking at fluxes at any given point in a watershed. And uh, this kind of idealized figure here showing if you could have a flux for each of these sub parcels, you'd be able to see what's happening on, on field scale. Um, in relation to actual amounts of nitrogen, not necessarily concentration. And we were able to get uh, very close uh, to that in some cases. Um, this is an example of a, a tile loading study that we did also in August of 2021. 
where we paddled the section of stream here. Um, you can see on the color gradient, uh, Lagrangian reference frame representing in-stream changes. But as we paddled past tiles, um, we had a, uh, a rudimentary way of measuring flow directly, um, a, a bucket that was measured to 10 liters and a stopwatch where we, we would take a number of different readings um, just to collect some, some uh, rough estimates of loading. Um, the sensors were then removed from the stream and placed into these into the samples from the tiles themselves. We were able to develop um, uh, some ranges for uh, loading from these tiles. Now, there's still some, some gaps in integrating, you know, the, the spatial scale that we're able to pick up Lagrangian from a pure Lagrangian standpoint with this Eulerian standpoint. But these tile drains essentially represent extremely small catchments um, limited to, to um, the, the tile networks. Um, these can occur, uh, you know, sub field scale and aren't necessarily defined, defined by things like topographic features. Um, so this provides an example of, uh, you know, an, uh, what we were seeking to do in this, uh, this, this cartoon here and, and what we can actually see on the field. Um, there are a number of other ways that we've been uh, looking to address this, um, but this is kind of a simple example of a, uh, or an estimation of a mixed reference frame. Uh, for other next steps, uh, this data that I've shown has all been related to nitrate and the nitrotech specifically. Uh, all of these runs occurring from 2020 onward also included uh, uh, SAND data, so seven other water quality parameters that were being taken. And these other parameters were seen to, to vary on the spatial and temporal trends, just like nitrate. And there's, uh, of course, an opportunity to study uh, this data from the perspective of these other parameters, such as uh, fluorescent dissolved organic matter and uh, turbidity, shown here. Um, there are also, uh, or I'll mention the discrete sampler too, the Bandolero discrete sampler, um, which uh, has the, the capability of collecting water samples for the testing of, uh, of nutrients uh, that aren't, uh, that can't be tested uh, through in situ uh, methods. This shows a kind of a preliminary study that was done in 2021 at, in the confluence with the Mississippi and Minnesota River in downtown St. Paul. And over the course of this paddle, um, these discrete samples were collected and tested for um, orthophosphate. And you can see kind of a Lagrangian example of, uh, of this, this, um, this phosphate, uh, which would not be available on the sensor platform that we currently have. Uh, there's also an application for integration of this data set with things like ACPF or the Agricultural Conservation Planning Framework. This is a, a GIS based uh, tool that seeks to kind of uh, uh, allow land managers uh, to implement some specific BMPs in locations at a field scale. So it uses GIS uh, layers and GIS data to um, recommend where certain, uh, certain practices should be, be placed or could be placed in order to have um, kind of uh, impacts that we'd want to see. And this occurs at the field scale. Um, but being a GIS method, there are some, uh, some uh, opportunities for validation from, from sensors. And the, the platform that we've shown has the ability to uh, uh, collect both uh, loading data, like those tiles, and um, in-stream concentration that could be related back to some of these in-stream processes. So this could used, uh, be used to validate some of the suggestions, as well as uh, inform some of the, the placement of some of these, these practices. Um, just to restate the conclusions. Uh, so uh, this packraft based method provides access to challenging and impactful watersheds that would not, uh, where there are methods to reliably do that now. Um, it distinguishes and quantifies spatio-temporal impacts at these varying spatial and temporal scales that we talked about, and it provides a platform for the integration of other data sets, whether that's just collecting um, locations of where tiles are flowing or finding ways to take direct measurements of tile loading, um, a number of different opportunities that uh, having a, a person in the stream uh, helps with. Uh, there are also implications for management and planning validation that again would link back to better adapting our best management practices to what we're seeing in the stream. Um, a number of acknowledgements I'd like to just uh, briefly mention. Uh, so funding for this project was provided by the USD FSA. Um, I'd like to thank uh, my advisors and committee members, uh, John Baker, 
Brent Dalzell and uh, Jacques Finley uh, for um, the, the guidance through this project. Um, I'm extremely grateful for it. Uh, I'd like to thank Bill Brighter, um, <laughs> who <laughs> caught on a Fino cam here, <laughs> and uh, for just providing technical support throughout this project and um, throughout the time that I've, I've worked here. Um, I'd like to thank Forrest Goodman, uh, who is one of four people who have uh, had the pleasure of paddling the boat down these streams. Um, and he knows uh, firsthand the, the hazards uh, um, and has helped in a lot of different ways with that. <laughs> um, I'd also like to thank Cade Flynn, who uh, came on and joined this project uh, this time last year. And he's been uh, an incredible asset to what we've been able to accomplish uh, with the methodology. And um, I really can't thank you enough for you know everything you've you help with this project with. Um, and stay tuned for a year from now. Here, his defense will be very exciting with the next steps of this. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Joel Nelson, Sarah Porter, um, Cody, uh, Cody Winker, and Todd Schumacher for their help with uh, GAS um, technical um, uh, assistance and for Todd for um, running our uh, samples through the latchet. So, with that, I'll take some questions. So how long can how long did it does it take to do eight miles? Is that a full day or uh... it depends on the flow. Um, usually it's anywhere from like four to six hours. Um, but we've had we've had some long days where we've taken up to twelve to fifteen miles of stream in a single day. And you know, there you're pushing about seven hours of paddling. It helps when you have another person to split that time with though. <laughs> um, but usually a four hour sampling run is kind of what we stuck with to get about a six mile area. One other question. Um, how did you decide what days to go and mm. how many days did, did you go and go? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it, it goes back to kind of looking at the, the sampling methodology. So it, originally we weren't sure we were going to see changes. And as soon as we started seeing changes, it became uh, once a week seems to be a good a good time frame to, to be able to sample. And there are other kind of conflicting, uh, you know, flow uh, the drought in 2021 created about a month uh, period where we weren't able to, to sample. So um, the goal became once once a week. Uh, and then when the rain would be in the forecast, we would try to book and runs to capture impacts of this, this rain event. And with things like the spring melt event, it just became again, you know, um, with the flexibility of the platform, just when can we actually get out the stream? And in some of those cases, like the spring melted that we were sampling uh, up to three times in a seven day period. So, yeah. Hi, John. If you could have any auxiliary data that mm -hmm. you don't currently have, what would it be? Auxiliary, inter uh, well, if, if there would be some way to measure instantaneous flow, that would be, <laughs> that would be, Perfect, because it would be a true integration of the the Galerian and Lagrangian um, reference frames, and it would allow for the high frequency that we're seeing in the concentration data to be directly related to a loading value, and that could both help um, show the impacts of these confluences where it's very clear that water masses are kind of merging, but it would also be able to find other impacts like um, there might be groundwater losses or gains in these st streams that we don't have the capability to find or there might be in-stream transformation of these nitrate species um, that knowing how much, knowing how the water mass changes would be a good way of, of doing that. We found some proxies to do that, but um, yeah, a magic sensor to find instantaneous flow would be perfect. <laughs> I think I know. Location of nearest Dairy Queen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a radar, yeah. <laughs> And ask them to just unmute and speak up if they have any questions. Oh no, we can we can let <laughs> we, can, we can let the roommates stay quiet. <laughs> uh, Joel, you had a question. I had a question. Um, so you've had the enviable or unenviable task of going that many miles, depending on the day and the temperature, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, from your experience going up and down that many miles of stream, you know, I think about 
autocorrelation and some of the points being so close together yep. is ownership. You talked about management validation and management practice. Mm -hmm. You think ownership is something that could be looked at in future parts of the study? Um, mm -hmm. We assume that one person owns it, they're gonna treat most of their acres the same. Mm -hmm. Is ownership, uh, total parcels that they have? I mean, it just, I'm interested in your thoughts based on mm -hmm. what you've seen up and down the stream. I know you haven't looked at parcel maps, mm -hmm. but uh, just shooting from the hip, curious what your thoughts were. Yeah, so it, it kind of, um, if, if we had a map that shows that there are certain fields that are having more impact than other fields, uh, you're talking about how, if that relates yeah, to- I'm thinking, you got to sense certain fields and then blocks of fields in mm. certain areas seem to be treated similarly, yeah. although you couldn't always see the field. Uh, what your thoughts were on that being a variable? We've looked, mm. you know, we're looking at land cover, we're looking at all these other management type considerations. It's just simple ownership, yeah. something to look at in the future as well. Yeah, I think so, because it, it depends on, again, the, the practices that are being used. So there might be some things that visually we can see areas that are in, you know, have been transitioned to, to prairies or is a very obvious one to see if a landowner has, um, you know, conventional corn soy systems next to a, a prairie. That's kind of an easy way of seeing these differences in ownership. But within, you know, similar fields, there might be things like soil conditions that could also impact uh, transport that we're seeing from, from these, these areas. And I guess that kind of speaks to the, the non-homogeneity of these landscapes, even though they're under, you know, similar practices that, that go back decades and decades and decades, um, they don't necessarily have similar impacts, even at that scale. Have questions for yeah. <laughs> I've got another question. Mm. Um, listed like three different um, types of um, monitors. It's the hawk. Oh, yes, uh, the sensors. The sensors. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the sensors. So, did you actually use the other ones as well, or you just reported on the hawk? This one? Just for, for the sake of this presentation, I limit it to. <laughs> so, okay, so. Um, YSI one, um, mm. that has a lot of, are you using any of that? Mm. So find any useful out of um, like, like for example, chloride or mm. turbidity. Uh, I think the two that we've mainly looked at that were gathered with that, that instrument were actually the optical nitrate sensor that uh, was so we mainly focused on the nitrate. We, we had, had looked at transitioning maybe to a platform that just used the SON. Um, so we looked at comparing the nitrate, um, but we also may, uh, looked at a fluorescent dissolved organic matter with this system too, especially through these wetlands. And you could see uh, variation. Um, I'm not sure if I included this, this figure, but um, on different dates, there is responses that you'd see um, in fluorescent dissolved organic matter across wetlands that would you know differ in different points of the year. So um, with just kind of the richness of this data set, um, there's uh, a lot of different yeah, opportunities to see like how does dissolved oxygen play into that as well. And um, that's a, a next step that I didn't explore fully for, for, for this application. Yeah. Really good job. Thank you. Yeah, John. Um, it looked like in some of your maps, um, you you sampled a lot of different um, streams that had different morphology. Mm -hmm. it looked like maybe some of them were engineered. I know that there were um, back in like the thirties they did like streamline straightening, stream channel mm -hmm. straightening. Yeah, yeah. Um, in certain areas, and so um, that's something that you were like interested in looking at differences between you know natural streams versus like engineered. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, again, for kind of the characteristics that come along with them. So that the tile density map that I showed just 100 tiles over this, this area. Um, in the western section where that's, you know, very ditched, uh, like a channelized stream. Uh, if you compare that to the eastern section across those, um, those, those wetland features in Highland Creek, um, there is almost no tile drains for miles and miles of that watershed. So it's not only kind of the morphology of the stream, but there's evidence where, where there might be point sources from these tile drains. There's more kind of non-point sources or, or overland flow maybe that's uh, adding uh, nutrients and water to, 
the bodies in the more natural streams. Um, so just kind of one characteristics that was also different in those between those those watersheds. There's historical evidence that a substantial portion of Pine Island Creek didn't really exist uh, yeah. pre settlement time. Upper, upper reaches, which is kind of all created. Yeah, Crane Creek also was a chain of six lakes that were uh, in order drained to provide flow for a downstream mill. Oh. So the stream itself was created, um, you know, around 1920. And only did a lot of that. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, some interesting. Um, think about previous, you know, infrastructure. And yeah. What that might mean for what we see now. I'll check that. Well, nice. Shall we give Ryan a hand and we'll uh, reconvene here? Thank you, everyone.